Well, good morning, everyone. I'm uh, Jeannie Forrest, and we're welcoming you to a new program of Dementia Unplugged Care Conversations. Today, we're going to be talking with an expert about brain health, movement, and cognition. And typically, I'd like to start with a disclaimer. All content, including any potential medical information is provided only as an informational resource only. And it is not to be used or relied on for any diagnostic or treatment process. It should not be used as a substitute for professional diagnosis, care and treatment. Please consult your healthcare provider before making any decisions or for guidance about a specific medical condition. The opinions expressed in the content shared by me, Dr. Forrest, and my guests are not necessarily the opinions and content of the Dementia Society of America. Thank you for listening to that. And the way we start out as well is I typically give an overview of what the word dementia is so that we're all sort of on the same page in terms of understanding. So <clears throat> for those of you who are new to the program, the word dementia is really considered sort of an umbrella term. Uh, like the word cancers, there's, there's many different types of cancers, there's many different types of conditions that present itself in a way that we name it a, a, a dementia. So the word dementia in it its, of itself is not a disease. And the more common um, uh, terms or the more conditions are those such as Alzheimer's disease, vascular dementia, can be mixed, there's Lewy body, frontal temporal, and the list goes on. Uh, but the most commonly known uh, typically is Alzheimer's disease. Uh, there are many conditions that can mimic dementia and not necessarily uh, progress as such, and they can be reversible, such as depression, uh, vitamin B deficiencies, uh, brain tumors, and, and so on. But needless to say, the, the ones that we are talking about typically are progressive and unfortunately uh, do not have a cure at this point in our understanding in science. So that's just a little bit of a background. I do want to say that you are listening to uh, now uh, sort of a triad under Dementia Unplugged, and this is called Care Conversations. Uh, but there are two others I want you to be aware of. That is Dementia Unplugged Musical Connections and Dementia Unplugged Artful Insights. So, Please pay attention to the Dementia Society of America's website for more information on those two uh, insightful programs. <clears throat> Our guest speaker today is Dr. Michael Trayford. He's the founder, director of clinical operations for Apex Brain Centers. And for those of you who may just be listening and do not have the opportunity to read this, I will read his, his bio. Uh, Dr. Trayford is a board certified chiropractic neurologist and board certified neurofeedback specialist with over 20 years of experience in the unique and groundbreaking field of functional neurology. Dr. Trayford has established a multimodal brain intensive training and rehab program built around the concept of neuroplasticity. And he can be reached uh, later on through his website, uh, www.apexbraincenters, all one word, dot com. In terms of format, uh, I will be speaking with uh, Dr. Trayford and asking questions for about 30 minutes and then opening it up to a question and answer for which you can send through the chat function. All right, and now we're gonna go uh, to our interview and I am going to stop sharing so that we could just see us. 
Well, good morning, Dr. Trayford. Good morning, Jeannie. How are you? I am. I'm great. Thank you. So glad you're here. <clears throat> and I do have to say my allergies are really uh, acting up today. So this is live. And if you hear a few coughs, I apologize in, in advance. So again, we're, we're thrilled that you're here and just can't wait to hear more about what you're doing. But I did want to open it up and, and, and start with sort of the question. Just tell us a little bit about your background and what prompted your interest in this topic? Yeah, so I came up in the uh, the physical medicine and rehabilitation world um, up in New York, you know, twenty plus years ago. Uh, undergrad and 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 postgrad was really interested in anatomy, physiology, physics, uh, how all of these things could be applied, biochemistry, how these things could be applied to treat the human condition, so to speak, and uh, started out in the world of of pain naturally with physical medicine and rehabilitation, multidisciplinary clinics. So you're you know, uh, orthopedics, neurology, chiropractic, acupuncture, massage, PT, OT, everybody working in one place for the, the greater good. So I got to learn to speak everybody's language. And it was really functional neurology and, and postgraduate education in my realm that really drew me to being able to treat the, the human condition, as it were, very differently. And that's with rehabilitative techniques, not just for the physical body, but for the cognitive brain as well. We would see when people's balance would improve, um, their attention and focus and memory would go up. Um, and that was subjectively. And then we started measuring these things. So we start seeing the parallels between the physical body, the cognitive, mental, and emotional body, and how when you elevate one, the other follows suit. So naturally, it was a uh, an extension into the realm of brain injury, uh, mild cognitive impairment, dementia, learning and behavioral issues, et cetera. So it was really an evolution over the years, but it was my interest in kind of bringing together the, the physics, anatomy, physiology, biochemistry, all under one roof and, and seeing where there were kind of gaps in the system, so to speak. I'm, I'm a firm believer in a time and a place for everything as uh, was shown with my work in the multidisciplinary practices, but uh, there were certainly large voids and there still remain large voids, particularly in the areas of dementia and some other things that I just mentioned. Wow. Um, so it, it is fascinating how you had the foresight to begin to integrate this for so long. There was such a disconnect in terms of science and, and medicine in terms of the brain and the body, right? We right. thought it was two separate things and right. we, we certainly know that 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 Cartesian sort of idea does that's you know that's not accurate at all. I think even still too, you know, you mentioned brain body connection and people, you know, they think it's this esoteric concept, but it's it's heavily rooted in the literature from all angles. You know, if you just Google, you know, uh, you know, movement and cognition, you will have resources to serve you for the rest of your life. So uh, it's out there. We just need to be able to connect the dots. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you about that. Um, <clears throat> so my next question is, what would you see as sort of the biggest myth about brain-body health connection, brain health? What, what would you start with that? It has to be hands down, uh, especially coming from the realm of neuroplasticity and, and the understanding that the brain can change until we take our last breath, for better or for worse. Uh, it's that myth that you're as good as you're going to get, or that's it. Uh, you know, I, every single day of my life, I hear people that have been told you're as good as you're going to get. Again, whether it's a brain injury, uh, whether it's uh, some form of dementia. Now, clearly there are neurodegenerative disorders that are degenerative in nature and constantly declining, but that doesn't mean people can't have elevations in humanism or quality of life with that. So, you know, there are cases where uh, people have been able to elevate function by simply changing activities of daily living and doing appropriate rehabilitation and changing their diets and, and so on and so forth. So, uh, you know, there's always a higher level of humanism and that's what we strive for. But uh, I will say, you know, hands down, if somebody tells you you're as good as you're going to get, don't listen and, and run for the hills. Yes, yes. That's, uh, thank you for that. So that really has a real message of hope. Yes. Uh, certainly in parallel with the Dementia Society of America's uh, vision and um, mission to, to instill that. Right. Because quality of life can 
um, slightly improve, maintain, but it really requires people who understand that and don't have that pessimistic yes. um, view. So, <clears throat> so in, in, in terms of that, you said it's almost a daily kind of occurrence. And, and, and so where, where do you see that struggle? Where, where is that pressure uh, coming from? Largely, it's coming from, and I understand full well where it's coming from. You know, there are factors of reality, liability. Um, so many of these other things come into play when people are getting advice from largely their healthcare practitioners, but also their families as well. You know, we want to instill hope, but we don't want to instill instill unrealistic hope. But the fact is, what we see on a regular basis is the bar is really set quite low. Meaning people are told, you know, this is as good as you're going to get, you know, the brain, your brain is not going to get better than where it's at right now. And you just have to accept that. And, um, you know, the vast majority of people clearly that we see have have not taken that um, as as gospel, so to speak. So, you know, there is uh, a lot of it coming from the healthcare world. I think a lot of it is insurance driven. Um, you know, the fact is we only get so much time within those insurance parameters to see somebody and work with them. And clearly in short periods of time, we're not going to be able to have a massive impact on things like dementia or brain injury. It needs to be, you know, much higher frequency of care, longer duration care, uh, but sticking with it over time is most people will realize that that higher level of ability or function, no matter how small that might be. Mm -hmm. So can you give some sort of concrete example? Someone comes in to see you, what type of um, strategies, recommendations to improve ADL? So what does that look like? Sure, sure. You know, we everything we we do, you know, we we always say you have to measure it to manage it. So we look at lots of numbers up front. We do a lot of testing and then we use the testing to drive treatment programs. So uh, we're doing testing of cognitive functions, attention, memory, focus, executive function, impulse control, those kinds of things. Uh, we're doing EEG or electrical output of the brain. We're measuring that and, and quantifying that against normative databases. We're doing physical uh, reflections of cognitive abilities, things like quantification of eye movements, inner ear balance centers. These things are very, very heavily related to higher human functions uh, and, and, and tied in. So when somebody has poor balance, they generally don't have great cognition. You know, look at babies and look at a senior with dementia. Do they have good balance? Do they have great cognition? No. Uh, so we need to look at the physical biomarkers as well. Uh, and motor timing is another one of those mechanisms we look at. Timing over time, neurological timing breaks down. And when we can start to rehabilitate these things towards more uh, advanced performance, whatever whatever that uh, you know ceiling is for an individual, then we'll start to see things like attention, focus, memory, et cetera, start to increase. But our programs are 100% paying respect to the uh, the tenets of neuroplasticity and that dictates you know the frequency and intensity of care determine whether nerve cells connect or communicate or stay together so the fact is we have to do things in a high frequency manner uh, which again is goes against the grain because if people are going for therapy they might go once or twice or three times a week we're seeing people three times a day for 5 10 or 15 days in a row so we're talking 15 contact hours per week per individual with physical, neurological, cognitive, and metabolic rehabilitation. Um, and then introducing other methods that are really starting to still great, show great promise in, in the realm of dementia, which would be uh, things like low-level laser therapy, hyperbaric oxygen therapy, and, and some others. So, uh, And clearly nutritional and metabolic protocols, higher fat diets, lower carbohydrate diets. Um, again, we're not saying that's good for everybody, but the fact is, you know, the way we eat dictates our brain function. We have to address that as well. So we just go down multiple avenues and do it very, very frequently for short periods of time, kind of like, you know, boot camps, if you will. Uh, if you ever want to get good at something, if you do it five days straight, you'll get better in those five days than you did the entire year practicing whatever it was, if, if it's mm -hmm. soccer or guitar or language. Mm -hmm. So do you bring in the uh, family members? Or how, how is this uh, in terms of strategy and, and learning and all of that? Is it just the person, the patient, or do you bring in other people so they're learning right. this at the same time? <clears throat> 
Yeah, clearly we, uh, you know, we, we tell people all the time when they come in, you know, we say we love you, but we hope we never see you again, meaning we can get them to a point and the family, the caregivers, or even the individuals themselves can continue the progress, uh, you know, getting tools in their hands to complement what they've done here. But yes, we, particularly in the, in the case of dementia, cognitive impairment, we, we almost always need a caregiver uh, or a spouse or whoever's going to be with the in individual most of the time to um, continue. And, and we develop very strategic, very specific home-based recommendations and um, and again, people can obtain a lot. There's a lot more you can do from a home rehab standpoint these days than you could five or 10 years ago. And we have patients getting hyperbaric chambers in their homes that are getting, um, you know, whole body vibration units, which are showing a lot in the um, in the dementia realm as well. So there's lots of things that can be done depending on level of ability, you know, financial ability, et cetera. So uh, we can help guide them on that. But yes, we want the caregivers involved every step of the way. And then how far out? So you do this program and then is there a longitudinal piece to this where you're studying impact over time? Um, yeah, we're, we're collecting data all the time. Uh, I have a, uh, a uh, clinical outcome study that was published in 2016, I believe it was. It was a, uh, a fellow who had a uh, uh, essentially mild cognitive impairment due to radiation to the brain from a benign ependymoma. So it was the radiation that caused the, the dementia, essentially the mild dementia that he had. Uh, and he went from 70 years old, high performing individual, still working, uh, scratch golfer, you name it, was just you know living his best life as they say. And within six weeks, uh, you know, he was essentially just looking at the walls in his home. And what happened was, and we, we recorded every piece of this from start to finish in terms of cognitive capacities, physical capacities, and as expected, the cognitive and the physical were very low to begin with. Uh, we did a 10 day program with them and showing on the order of about 30% gains in the areas of executive function, cognitive flexibility, and some others. And what happens over time now, we've been looking at that data. We have graduate students come in sometimes and mine the data for us. And we're starting to see uh, now that we can, in many cases, start to uh, through consultation, determine, you know, is this someone that might benefit, you know, 10%, 20%, 30%. We still don't have the crystal ball. We can't give, uh, you know, exact uh, figures to everybody, but we have the data knowledge now over the past 10 plus years of recording the physical and cognitive together uh, that we can, we can, you know, start to more accurately predict what somebody's outcomes might be. It, how is it different for the different um, conditions? Uh, for, so like FTD versus vascular dementia. Mm -hmm. So what are you, what do you do differently based on the underlying etiology? Um, you know, largely, you know, again, it's the, the, the testing that dictates the treatment as well as neurological examination history. Uh, we're so multifactorial. So the fact is when people are dealing, you know, Alzheimer's type three diabetes, right? There's a blood sugar component uh, and small vessel damage in really most types of dementia. So we have to look at that angle, you know, more importantly, sometimes than the neurological rehabilitation, we need to look at the metabolic functions. You know, there's, you know, there's all kinds of guesstimates, but, you know, at least 50% of people with dementia have some sort of blood sugar handling issue, if not full blown type two diabetes. So if we don't address that component, we're missing the boat. And uh, a lot, you know, a lot would say, well, once you have type two diabetes, you've got it, you know, that is the case for some people, but you can always imp improve that blood sugar, getting down the hemoglobin A1C, getting down the fasting blood glucose through shifts to higher fat, more lower, you know, lower carbohydrate uh, ratios, you know, Bredesen protocols. Uh, there's so many different methods out there, but it's all, you know, directed in the same manner, calorie restriction, intermittent fasting. Um, again, we're not recommending these for everybody, but there's a lot of value. And as we see, the numbers get more stable, whether hemoglobin A1C, fasting blood glucose, uh, the cognitive capacities begin to elevate. Now we can throw the rehabilitation on top of that because we have a system that's functioning better. And that's where they can, you know, as we say, the, the sky's the limit for that individual. Indeed. My, I'm going to guess, maybe without even uh, opening it up yet to the chat, 
people would ask, how much does this cost? Is this through insurance? So how, how do people pay for your program? Yeah, so clearly, you know, obviously insurance is our biggest hindrance, uh, particularly when getting into Medicare, Medicaid. Uh, there's just no uh, allowance for things that are, you know, aggressive treatments for things that are chronic in nature, right? Unless it's cancer or something like that. So uh, in terms of rehabilitation for somebody with cognitive impairment, doing something three, four, five hours a day, the insurance companies look at that and they frankly frown upon it, even though these things were done before managed care came to town, you know, late 70s, early 80s. Um, there were physical therapists, occupational therapists working with cerebral palsy uh, and Down syndrome and other things, five, 10, 15 hours a day sometimes and seeing re remarkable results. Uh, but then managed care said, no, we've got to do, you know, 15, 20 minute sessions, one, two, three times a week. So, uh, you know, there are potential allowances for out of network reimbursement for many. Uh, we do see that uh, there are, you know, payment strategies. It is, uh, you know, it is a, a fee for service type of scenario. We try to, in, in many cases, recognize that people are on fixed incomes, whether senior citizens or people that have had brain injuries. Uh, so we have different levels of, of, uh, understanding for senior discounts or, you know, military discounts, et cetera. So, you know, when there's the will, there's the way. And we, we have a lot of folks that uh, may not appear to have the ability, but then they are able to manage through friend networks and church networks and uh, crowdfunding has become incredibly popular for healthcare. Um, and it's something that people are scared to do or, or even times, uh, you know, too proud to do. And I understand that, but more and more it's becoming uh, necessary for people to get the care uh, that they need in the instances where there's no other really great options out there. Now, well, thank you for sharing that. Uh, but, you know, what I'm hearing is there's a whole variety of ways that people can address that financial concern. Um, when you were talking, uh, it prompted another question. Are you seeing any variance between gender or um, ethnic you know, backgrounds, cult, uh, race backgrounds in terms of uh, success within your program? Uh, what's more effective? Does it break down at all by demographic? As far as the, the success goes, I'd say no. The, the interesting thing is, you know, demographically speaking, uh, you know, female, females are just more inclined to seek out care either for themselves or their, their spouses. Um, so we, we see more women with, uh, you know, mild cognitive impairment and, and even early stage dementia because they're, they're dealing with these things, whereas the men tend to, you know, put it off a little bit longer and, and don't want to admit that they're less than what they used to be. Um, you know, I think we all have issues with that, but I, I think the women uh, tend to get around those issues a bit earlier. So for them, I would say the, the, the outcomes are more successful because we're often intervening much earlier in those cases. Uh, but then again, if somebody's coming in with some level of cognitive impairment, there's been something brewing under the hood, so to speak, for, you know, probably 5, 10, 15 years. Yeah, yeah. It just doesn't typically come on automatically, right? So what would you like other health practitioners to know um, about the work that you're doing? What, Because this is not typically common knowledge in the, in the way people are approached uh, right. with any form of death. So what would you like other practitioners who may be listening or family members to tell other practitioners? Yeah, I would say, you know, a lot of folks like to go right for that, you know, what's the evidence-based approach, right? And evidence-based on, on the surface sounds really good, right? You want evidence behind something to prove that it's going to have a certain outcome. But the fact is we're dealing with conditions, be it dementia, be it brain injury, be it addictions, be it whatever, that there's really no great evidence-based protocols available. Right, uh, you know, dietarily we have Bredesen protocols, phenomenal systems, uh, but the fact is we have very little in terms of evidence-based care. So it's really the pioneers in any discipline, be it neurology, be it um, you know nutrition, be it whatever, that are are blazing trails. 
and seeing really great things happening from a clinical outcomes perspective, but they're so bogged down like myself in practice uh, that we don't have all day to, you know, write papers. We have tons of data, but we just don't have the ability to do that. What we're doing is we're taking the best of the best of the research that's out there and connecting the dots. And I think that's really important because as specialized as healthcare is, people get into their discipline and they just they, they home in on that discipline. But the fact is there's so much crossover, especially when it comes to the brain. So we need to be looking at the physical therapies, the metabolic therapies, you know, the eye movement therapies, the balance and vestibular therapies, and putting all this information together. At the end of the day, nearly everything we do is uh, a lot of our testing procedures, FDA cleared, a lot of our interventions have to, uh, FDA clearances, plenty of evidence to support what we do, but it's the combination of such that is not quote unquote evidence-based, but the fact is the evidence is in the outcomes. Um, and that's what we're first and foremost concerned with is clinical outcomes. So, you know, I would have people question that and, and start to connect the dots themselves, um, you know, provider or patient alike and understand that we can't singularly address these systems. We have to do it all at once. Thank you. Um, I'm going to start asking the audience to uh, perhaps add some questions into the chat. Um, and my question before they start to come in is what would you recommend for people? What, what can they do now? Knowing what you know, you know, what sort of basic life approaches to, to diet and movement would you recommend for people to really start considering intentionally now? Right. Yeah. You know, as far as movement goes, uh, I talk about this stuff all the time, movement and cognition. I participate in a, uh, an annual conference that happens at different universities. It was at Tel Aviv last year in uh, Harvard, Oxford. Um, it's going to be in Paris next year in September, hopefully, if, if the world is, is working again. But, you know, there, there are providers in all disciplines from across the globe coming together because they realize if people move their bodies, their brains work better. Uh, and this is really cool because there's a lot of academic, there's a lot of clinical, there's a lot getting into um, the realm that you wouldn't typically see at academic conferences, like people in Tai Chi and dance and yoga and Pilates, uh, but they all come together every year and share. And, and really, so movement equals cognition and movement will better your cognition. So number one, first and foremost, people need to start moving. A lot of people just don't move um, and they don't move purposefully. Sit to stand, getting out of a chair under your own power is being shown to be likely one of the greatest pr predictors of mortality. So if we can just, and aside, aside from blood sugar, waist to hip ratios, all those other things, cardiac markers, just simply being able to get out of a chair under your own power, activating your anti-gravity muscles um, can be one of the greatest predictors of mortality. There's a lot in that right there, which means we need to be able to do these things and do them effectively. Uh, so just simply getting moving and then looking at, uh, activities that would be more purposeful movement based like Tai Chi, like yoga, uh, Pilates, Feldenkrais, there's all kinds of things out there. But they're, at the end of the day, they're all neuromuscular re-education techniques that have a profound impact on our cognitive abilities. So movement is key. And we could certainly, I'm sure we'll address the nutrition stuff and some of the other questions. Okay. I'm going to start looking at, uh, here's a question. Sounds like, okay, this is the go Sounds like cost varies, but can you give a general range of an example of what it costs to get started? Yeah, so we have what we call a day of discovery. And that's where people come in for five hours of all the different types of testing that we talked about, uh, full neurological histories, you know, re reviewing any prior um, tests and records, et cetera. And then we go through the phases of diagnostic testing, including EEG, cognitive testing, all the physical biomarkers I spoke of. Um, that day, that full day plus the report and everything is, is 950 for the day. But again, we have different levels of uh, discount uh, payment plans, et cetera. Uh, and programs can run anywhere from, you know, if we're looking at a handful of treatments, a couple of hundred dollars to several thousand dollars, depending on the, the frequency of care. Most of what we do is very high frequency. And those programs can range anywhere from, you know, around 2000 to about 6,000, depending on the, the level of, it's really all about the level of connection with the provider, because everything we do is one-on-one -on -one based. We're not using aids and assistance. 
Uh, everything is done with the doctors. So that's really important. So nothing falls through the cracks. Uh, and that includes quite a bit more than that, but that's that's the gist, the gist of it. Thank you. All right, so other questions. What type of diet or diet program is most beneficial for most people to follow? I realize that each person will have some differences and that's part one. And then part two, is there a video program that one can follow that is exercises that can help improve balance, maintain an already good balance? So yeah, nutrition so and uh, video program. <laughs> Yeah, to the first part of that, uh, what happens is, uh, you know, like was stated in the question is that there's no one for everybody, but we understand as humans, as American humans, we eat way too much. We eat far more than our body needs. So looking at calorie restriction, and I'm not, I'm not talking, uh, you know, extreme calorie restriction, but cutting the excess out, we eat way too much. We're a supersized society still. Uh, and with that, we're typically flipped on the ratios of foods that we eat. We have you know, lots and lots and lots of carbohydrates and sugar, moderate amount of protein and very little fat. We need to flip that around so that we have a lot more healthy fats for our brains in the diet. Um, and then we have moderate protein and lower carbohydrate intake. We understand insulin sensitivity, uh, blood glucose, all these things, thyroid function, adrenal function, all work better when we take in less carbohydrate, really important. Then there's extremes of that ketogenic diets that we can, mon those have to be monitored. And we, we use those for folks that are a bit more severe um, so that we get their brains burning fat for fuel on a more regular basis as opposed to sugar. Uh, but again, those types of things need to be supervised. A lot of people are running into those things unsupervised and, and could be doing more, more harm than good. Uh, Bredesen protocols are the most widely accepted protocols. And there's lots of similarities there with lower carbohydrate consumption. Uh, one thing to mention is diagnostic testing. Uh, we test folks all the time that are dealing with, say, um, you know, leaky guts. Uh, they, they have, you know, the, the junctions in their gut that allow things to go in and out, you know, into the bloodstream are, are too big sometimes. So what happens is we can measure certain things with, you know, healthy gut bacteria, not healthy gut bacteria. Uh, are people digesting fats appropriately? Sometimes they're not. So you can take all the fat you want in, but if you're not digesting it appropriately, something needs to be done. So there are laboratory tests that can help direct nutritional programs as well, uh, which is a, a big part of what we do, because again, measure and manage, not just yeah. blindly go into something. Yeah, no, no, that makes <clears throat> all the sense in the world. Thank you. And the question about a, a, a video yes. program. <laughs> yeah. So as far as video programs, there are companies out there. I've done um, uh, interviews and uh, light classes for a company called MedFit. Um, they've got a bunch of things online. They're kind of an online university, if you will for uh, you know for physical therapists and, and other people in the healthcare world, but also for the general public. Uh, the key is, you know, people need to do things to their ability level. And clearly in the realm of cognitive impairment dementia, there's a whole realm of ability, a whole realm. So, you know, too much too soon again could could promote more harm than good. So you have to get some level of assessment on physical capacity, functional capacity, and and engage in something that would be beneficial for you. And, and what I find too, is that certain therapies get too aggressive too quick. So if you can't get up out of a chair under your own power, you need to work on those things first before you start, <clears throat> you know, <clears throat> excuse me, before you start balancing on one leg with your eyes closed, right? There has to be a natural progression. So, you know, I'll just kind of leave it at that. There are resources out there, but you have to have some level of balance, vestibular uh, and physical evaluation first. No, yeah, right. It's all, it's a showing again, how it's all integrated. Um, um, okay, I'm, here's another question. If one believes that he has, it might be Wernicke Korsakoff syndrome, WKS, what should be done for a diagnosis? I'm not sure I understand the question to obtain a, a, an official diagnosis. Uh, I guess that's sort of, yeah, I, that would be my understanding. There's a, they suspect on their own. No, um, if you suspect, then you need to get to the neurologist and, and have that diagnosed. Yeah. Yeah. I think the, uh, you know, internet is great for information. It's a double-edged sword. Um, I really have embraced the internet, whereas we used to kind of steer people away from 
shopping their signs and symptoms around. But the fact is most people have to because they're waiting months and months and months to get an appointment with a specialist. But, um, you know, just keep calling around, take, you know, go for a, a longer distance if you have to, but get into somebody immediately and get and get that diagnosis. The sooner, the better. Yeah. OK. Uh, someone's raising their hand. And uh, let's see. OK. So maybe the, the raise of the hand is just uh, an affirmation of what you're saying. I don't see any other questions. That, that, that is, look one more time. No, that's, oh, here we are. Here we go. Have you written a book, other experts you appreciate, like Dr. Perlmutter? Have I, oh, I'm in the process of writing a book. It's actually a um, something I've been working on in my head and finally pen to paper for the last year and a half. Uh, it's really more about brain-based addiction recovery. We work a lot with adulthood learning and behavioral issues, and clearly there's uh, a large crossover into cognitive impairment there, you know, damage people have done to their brains through excessive drug and alcohol use. Uh, but clearly there's a, a big connection between brain injury and addiction and cognitive impairment. Uh, so uh, I just wrote a, a chapter in a book called Concussion Discussions about the concussion addiction connection. Uh, and then there's a lot we get into with the cognitive impairment that, uh, you know, that essentially perpetuates addiction. But yes, that should be out in 2022, hopefully. Yes. Wow. Hey, okay. hopefully in the midst of all this, you have time to sleep. And, and, and so I'll, I'll, I'll end with maybe this question because I don't see any other formal. So just for yourself, people will often ask, so how do you spend your day caring for yourself? Obviously you're, you know, you're busy doing, keeping your brain going with all of this, but what is it you do for yourself to, to take care of you? Um, well, it, for me, it varies. I'm, I'm, I'm not a creature of habits. I like novelty, and, and novelty is incredibly important with, uh, with dementia, cognitive impairment, because you know when you do the same thing the same way all the time, the brain isn't necessarily getting, you know, fully uh, activated the way it should, as when we're constantly learning new things. So I just, I, I kind of take that to heart and do new things all the time. But currently, my kind of usual routine, and we have resources available to us just because of the clinic. But I, I jump in the hyperbaric chamber at 6 30 in the morning every day for an hour um, and then I row I, I've just taken up rowing is uh, something I've always wanted to do it's a tremendous full body activity that people can do really at almost any age you engage all of your muscles including those important anti-gravity muscles that have so much to do with how well this is working up here and um, and then I just I eat well I, in, I intermittent fast every day to protect my brain because I tend towards type two diabetes, if I let it go out of control, like back in my buffet days, you know, it's uh, I could eat and eat and eat. I'm, I'm a foodie. I love to eat. But the fact is when I eat, my blood sugar gets out of control, even though I eat quite healthy. So um, I've been calorie restricting through intermittent fasting for two years and my blood sugar sits very stable, um, which is, you know, still kind of high. I'm about 95 on my blood sugar, but if I didn't control, it would be 110, 115, 120. And, uh, you know, so just trying to do as much as I can, I, you know, naturally with uh, kids and practice and everything else going on in the world, stress is a big factor. Um, I kind of go in and out of my meditation habits, but uh, meditation is a big part of my life too, that I need to get back into because, uh, you know, that's probably the one thing that'll take care of this more than anything. Well, I can't thank you enough uh, for sharing your wisdom uh, your insights. Uh, yeah, this is going to be benefit a lot of people on this call. And it will also be recorded so people can listen to this uh, on, on future dates. Any last words you'd like to end before um, I sh go back to sharing the screen? Any last thoughts that we didn't, that I didn't ask you? Is there any question that was not asked or I did not ask you that you want to make sure you, you hit home with it? No, I think, um, you know, I could go on for hours about this stuff. I just want to thank you for everything you do for DSA. And, uh, you know, you're a rock star over there and, and Kevin for all the great work he's done. So um, I just want to take the time to thank you all for everything you're doing for this this community, because it's a very misunderstood community and, and dementia is a big deal. It's not just one condition. And, and most types of dementia are actually quite uh, treatable, if you will. Mm -hmm. Wonderful note. Okay. Um, 
So I, everyone on the call, I'm gonna share the screen and end up with the last few slides. Oh, we did the interview. And, and now of course, this is when the technology is, there we go. Yeah. So we had the questions. So the last slide here is really just a, a, a shout out to the Dementia Society of America. Uh, thank you again for, for allowing me to host this program. Uh, the website uh, for the Dementia Society of America um, is DementiaSociety.org. It's just chock full of, of uh, information, particularly helpful to uh, family and professional caregivers. So when you have a moment, please take a look at that. And perhaps you can also donate uh, to continue these uh, types of programs. So on that note, again, Dr. Trayford, it is a real pleasure to, uh, to see you. And I know you're a super busy guy, so uh, appreciate really taking the time to share, to share your knowledge. My pleasure, Jane. Thank you so much. Uh, you are welcome. Okay, everyone, we will see you next time. Thank you again uh, for joining Dementia Unplugged Care Conversations. Take good care.